The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. One of the things I love about doing this show is how something said in one program can provoke a powerful response in a listener, and then in turn, that listener contacts me, describes what happened to them, and how the program they were listening to provoked the memory of a breakthrough vision that they'd had in their own life. So they contact me, and suddenly they're sharing their story with our audience as well. Well, our guest today, Carl Crummins, is a perfect example of this. Carl was listening to last month's interview with Victor Hicks when something Victor described jumped out at him. It was all about the power of God's empathy for the suffering of mankind. Well, let me tell you a little about Carl's life. He was born in New York City to immigrant refugee parents right after World War II. When he dropped out of architecture school to work directly in the building trades, he was drafted into the Army. And after the Army, Carl says he tried... LSD and had his first uh, STE, spiritually transformative experience. That event set up to studying uh, Western and Eastern spiritual literature. And Carl writes about himself, quote, I was and still is um, influenced, I still am influenced by Gurdjieff and the Fourth Way teachings. Based on those ideas in conjunction with my experiences, I was moved to start an intentional community, communes as they were called back then, as I well recall. As part of my vision, that living together cooperatively was a solution to the dysfunctions of society that I could implement. And from that experiment, I realized that I didn't understand people or know myself and that I needed help. So I went on a journey which eventually brought me to the help I needed, and that help triggered my second STE. It also led me to marriage, a family, becoming a carpenter and contractor, and living in a spiritual community. And later I started traveling and living in different parts of the U.S. and some other countries. And after retiring, I lived in India for seven years, initially to work in an orphanage. Uh, India was where I, introduced, uh, where I was introduced to NDE stories, which have continued as a focus of study. And currently I'm working with a small group of folks starting up an IONS chapter in Prescott, Arizona. Carl, welcome to NDE Radio. Yes, hi, Lee. Glad to be here. <laughs> yes, I'm glad you're here, too. Carl, you yeah. wrote that um, uh, Victor Hicks' story of God experiencing people suffering was the first time you'd heard any reference to what you had once experienced yourself. So tell us about your experience. Well, this was during, um, I had, a, I guess what's called an STE, and during that time, I was kind of in an altered state of of, uh, being. And one morning when I was meditating or praying, this, um, this, whatever it was, descended on me. And what descended on me was this intense, acute sense of anguish. It was beyond endurable. It was... I think it only lasted a few moments. That those few moments, it was it was unendurable. It was unimaginable, and and then it and then it departed. Fortunately, it was something I wouldn't wish on my my worst enemy. But anyway, I, the sense, the awareness that I had after that was that this is what something suffers for our rejection of its love. And I didn't make any inference as to what this something was. It was just a totally anomalous, mysterious thing because I'd never read anything about anything like that. And, and it really remained kind of a, an anomaly for me for many years until I heard, I'd always been looking for it and in literature and stuff and never found anything. I came from a tradition that said that the work that we're doing is to help alleviate the suffering of the absolute. And that was always a mysterious phrase and was never clarified and, and you really couldn't wrap your mind around, you know, God suffers. What is this about God's, you know, eternal love and ecstasy and, and such? So 
when I was listening to your show and Victor described what sounded like the same thing that I had in his in his <clears throat> description. He said that he was complaining to God, saying, "You know, we you know we suffer horribly here. Do you suffer?" And he was given the experience of what it is like for God or the Absolute um, when we are when we hurt one another. And when I heard that, that was like you know, bells rang in me because this is the first time I'd ever encountered anyone a reference to what had happened to me. And and I was really glad and I started renewed my thinking about the whole um about what the thing the meaning of the thing because initially it was it was it was a, a mystery to me. But with what Victor said, it struck me that um I don't know if I can put this into words properly, but uh, that, well, I guess it simply translates into to doing what we're we're um, asked to do, which is to to when we are hurt and some when somebody injures us, uh, to go to turn the other cheek, mm. and which is uh, I guess easier said than done, but. So it's to not lash out, not strike back for the injuries and hurts that happen to us in life. And it's certainly, you know, life is a real, here is not a cakewalk for many people. I mean, we land here, we're not given an instruction manual for what's going on or what to do. Uh, it's confusing, and we're inevitably going to be hurt, disappointed, feel discouraged, and and you know it's it's not an easy ride and and so you know what do we do with that and right. the idea of well turn the other cheek that sounds good but and then what do you do with the feelings this was the other half of the thing as i've been thinking about it what do you do with the feelings of when it's great to just say nothing somebody insults you or whatever happens to say nothing you're not adding you know, in defense of yourself or in attacking the other person, you're just compounding the situation. But in the meantime, you have these feelings. You have your people hurt, insulted, whatever whatever the form of hurt is. What happens to that? What happens to right. that energy? One of the one yeah. of the things that people are always saying is, we cause each other so much pain and suffering in the world. Why doesn't God do something about it? And of course, God has. Um, has freed us, you know. Everyone says, "Well, you know, given our our circumstances, there is no real, really, no such thing as free will." But, and maybe that's true. Maybe we're trapped by certain patterns. But God has let go. You know, the 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 thing I always think about is um, the Sting song: "If you love somebody, set them free." Mm-hmm. He goes, "Free, free, set them free, 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 set them free." If you need somebody, call my name, which is a something that you can do with God. But he feels really, I think, obliged to give us free reign in our lives and and uh, hopefully we'll return to him in the end. But that freedom is where that pain comes from because that's, that's where God doesn't interfere and we inflict it on ourselves and on each other. Yes. And um, uh, what to do with that pain? Um, mm. Anyway... It, it reminded me of a quote of, of C.G. Jung. Neurosis is always a substitute for legitimate suffering, which reminded me, which, uh, of, um, I think a lot of people have said this. And, and as I, I came to this out of my own experience of just feeling of, of, um, you keep your, you don't, you don't react to something that happens to you that's unpleasant. In the meantime, you're feeling hurt, and what happens? And I found that if I just was with the feelings that it hurt, and this is this is like cold comfort to say, you know, be with the feelings because they really are painful. But if you're with them and don't create a story about them, don't blame the person, don't blame yourself, don't go into any myth-making storytelling. The feelings leave, and, and then it's over. And the, around the, 
the C.G. Jung quote, you know, the thing is, is what does neurosis mean? What is legitimate suffering? And I don't know that I want to attempt to answer neurosis, but legitimate suffering is, is that when things happen, you know, life has disappointments and, and major discouragements. And people leave you and you feel alone and you're lonely and you're depressed. Um, depression is a different thing. Depression, no, never mind. <laughs> I don't want to go there. But anyway, that that we we have we have these feelings, and to just be with the feelings as best we can allows us to then move on, rather than when we start telling ourselves a story about ourself or or the other person, especially about ourselves, that we get into the storytelling that, that you know children can't imagine that when their parents betray them, that it's a betrayal. They blame themselves. And this is difficult stuff to sort out that you have to do as an adult because you can't do it as a child. But anyway, it reminded me of another quote uh, from uh, James Baldwin, the writer. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once the hate is gone, they will have to deal with their pain. That, that is just so true. And, well, in my experience, that's uh, uh, the way to short circuit or bypass hate is to deal with your pain, is to instead of going into the storytelling about what was wrong with the other person, to deal with your pain. I thought and that's, I where, recently, that's, mm-hmm. that's where that freedom that uh, God has given us, we need to pass on to the, to the person who has hurt us the person that perhaps wants to separate from us we have to let them go or we're or we're trapped in a pain that we uh will probably rationalize or um turn into a neurosis of some sort as you say go ahead yeah and it, yeah and it's it's whatever the whatever somebody does i've come to realize is that nobody's doing anything personally to me they're doing Whatever they're doing is out of their own process, out of their own pain, out of their own ignorance. I mean, I think that, you know, people talk about, well, people are evil. There is evil. I don't believe that there is evil. I think that there is ignorance. And if people understood what their self-nature was, they wouldn't behave the way they do. So it's not, they wouldn't strike out. They'd realize that, that, you know, we're all connected. But that's not, um, that sounds great. How do you get there? to that. But anyway, on my end, I realized that when somebody, whatever people do, the worst things, it's out of ignorance and it's out of their own disassociation and disconnection with source, with their, with their own pain. So, you know, if you can get to that and it makes it somewhat easier to manage. Let let me, let me ask you though, how, what are our obligations in this world when it comes to justice? Um, Perhaps God loves us um, and forgives all sin. I mean, that's what the universalists believe. But in this world, do you think we should work for justice and equality and fairness? Should we should we fight the the corruption that we see in the world, um, even though it's uh, we could we could pass it off as as a a, a neuro, neurotic behavior on the part of the capitalists and whatever. Is that something that, uh, where do you feel about, how do you feel about reconciling justice and love? Well, what I think about it, what I feel about it, I don't know. But what I think about that is that that's a difficult, that's a really difficult question. It depends on your situation in life. It's like that question isn't it, you ask it as a general question, but it's individual. There is no right answer that fits everyone, in my opinion. We're all in a unique we're all in circumstances. If I were a Harvard-educated lawyer and worked for the ACLU, my res- you know my obligation as part of my job would be to speak up to things. It depends. But if you're a parent, you know what is your obligation? You're not in a position. I mean, most of us are not in positions to fight social. To, to again, it's so subjective. I, I don't even want to say that. It depends on your life circumstance. Certainly, we shouldn't be complicit by remaining silent. We should at least acknowledge it. 
yeah, this is this is not ideal. This is this is wrong. This is hurting people. And if and if it can again, it depends on conversations because somebody starts speaking, you know, in a way that we don't agree with. You know, can we can we can we speak to them without further polarizing them and the whole situation? Can we say, well, you know, do I have the ability to, and that's an ability to say, can you tell, you know, I hear you saying this, can you tell me more about why you believe that? And let them, allow them to speak their their peace and their truth and, and experience being heard before you say, well, that's one point of view and it may be valid, but I don't know that I that I agree with that. And would you like to hear, you know, do you want to hear my point of view? You know, that that would tend to be less polarizing. Right now the situation is we don't know how to we don't know how to listen to one another and respect one another. So anyway, I've kind of gone around your question because I don't think it could be answered as a generalization. Everybody's in the, in a different situation in life. Well, you quoted Gurdjieff, uh, the phrase alleviating the suffering of the absolute. And yes. uh, love would be the predominant way of doing that. Perhaps justice plays a hand in it as well. Uh, there, there's so much suffering in the world that could be could be fixed if we would only feed the hungry and and clothe the poor and you know house the homeless and all of that. That's mm-hmm. that the different kinds of suffering. There's emotional suffering, and then there's just the basic physical suffering that comes out of uh, inequality in this world. Um, did, did you feel after your uh, st uh, spiritually transformative experience that you better understood that phrase from Gurdjieff? No. <laughs> really, I went, that's an wow, honest answer. Well, <laughs> well, it became like a big question mark for me, where I would read, you know, certain things are common sense. Let me tell you a, 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 a curious spiritually transformative experience that I had that was you might call it very low grade. I was in a nonviolent communication study group that I started, trying to learn better how to listen to people. And uh, one of the ladies commented that she was in an altercation with her roommate, and her roommate was just going on and on about all sorts of stuff and wasn't particularly accurate and wasn't hadn't been paying the rent and stuff. And she said, you know, I realized that anything I was going to say was going to make the situation worse, so I didn't say anything. And that was like bells went off in my mind. You know, I, I may not have the skill to address somebody, but I could, but I cannot say anything back to them. And this question that you asked earlier about um, free will or we don't have free will, I think we have way less free will, in my experience, from careful observation, we have much less free will than we would like to imagine. But what we always have the possibility of is controlling, we can't control other people, we can't do anything about the world that maybe we can um, manage ourselves, manage our emotions, or I wouldn't call manage them, I would say feel them and be with them. So I can't stop someone from thinking or doing what they're going to do, but I can possibly be with, manage my own reactivity. And that's a huge amount of what um, the Gurdjieff work, there's a phrase in the Gurdjieff work that's called... um, Tolerating the negative manifestations of others. This, that's the, that idea is, uh, it, it is what it, what, in, uh, intent, there's an expression, um, uh, conscious labors and intentional suffering. I think the intentional suffering refers to tolerating the negative manifestations of others without reactivity, without, dem- you know, showing any expression of negativity. And so, um, anyway, so I think that, that in terms of free will, what's real is what is in front of you in your life. As I said, if you're an ACL lawyer, you have a very, diff- very different things on your plate than if you're a housewife or um, a nurse or, or in some other aspect of life. It's what do you have 
showing up in front of you that day, facing that and and dealing with that. Anyway. There's another verse from that, from that Sting song, If You Love Somebody, Set Them Free. It goes, if it's a mirror you want, just look into my eyes, or a whipping boy, someone to despise, or a prisoner in the dark tied up in chains you just can't see, or a beast in a gilded cage. That's all some people ever want to be. If you love somebody, set them free. It's um, it's so that inner relationship lyrics. that... Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's pretty amazing song, but that uh, that freedom, that free will, that you, I agree with you. There there seems to be ver- huge limitations on our free will, but it may only mean that God has freed us from His control to do. Definitely, yes. Yeah, and that's you know, uh, and that and that's resented by a lot of people. And yet, if He did control us, we would just be robots. Puppets. Yeah, we'd be puppets. And that's the thing we, part of what I found with that is my, one of the two things that I had at, at the, at the onset of my second STE was that everybody is already enlightened. Everybody is whole, perfect, and complete, just the way they are. And the other thing was that I am responsible, but the, the, the responsibility I couldn't appreciate at the time. But that's the whole thing. God, God is letting us I mean, help is constantly raining upon us if we were to, um, let's say, look around, look outside of our mind. But that the world is the way it is, not because God made it that way, but it's because God's allowing us to create what we create. Mostly, we're not creating anything. We're living in reactivity and mechanicality. So the world's showing up as a reaction, not as a creation, but we have the potential to create. And a lot of people create in, in, in many different ways. So, um, but the point is, is that that we don't want responsibility. We we want God to be responsible as an avoidance for our own. And this is my two cents on this, um, yes. as an avoidance of responsibility, which is really a, a you know no small um, a heavy thing if you start thinking about it that we're responsible for everything. I, I believe that I'm responsible for everything that is going on around me, that I can perceive around me. Mm-hmm. And that's my immediate environment. And that's tough because there's some things that I see, like when parents are scolding kids at the supermarket or, you know, dragging them around, you know, that, that pains me. Should I go up to the parent and, and, and say, you know, well, I don't you know, give them some sort of uh, input or just let that be. I've come from trying that, gone. I'm, I don't know that it didn't just make the situation worse for the child. Yes. So just witness that and feel, in my, I feel that like all I can do is feel the pain of that in myself, the sorrow of the ignorance of, the, of this person doing this. And you, and I'm you, always feeling conflicted as, you know, should I have gone up to them or, you know, what's the right choice? And there's no, like, there's, I'm not giving, you know, there's no instructions for this. Right. You wrote, when you, when you wrote to me, you said, um, uh, you realized that you needed help and you went mm-hmm. on a journey which eventually brought me the help I needed. And you capitalized help, which almost sounded like a God input to me. How yeah. how would you define that help? Well, the in that tradition that I was in, um, the the teacher, in a broader sense, was was fell into the category of help. But help is very broad. Help is, you know, help is somebody. That, it didn't want to personalize that. It happened to be. Yes, it is. It is God's help, and maybe all the help that we receive in the myriad ways that receive it is God's help. If you, you know, if you step back and go, that we're all one. We're all, we're all, let's say, fingers of the same hand of God. That it's always God's help. But in that tradition, it was stated as help, so that you didn't focus on exclusive. Um, exclusive identification that this is help and that's not help. 
so that it opened that up that any anything that furthers your understanding and your process in in uh <laughs> lessening your reactivity and opening you up to a more creative response to life has helped so that you didn't personalize it with the guide. Right. Does that did answer your question? Yes, it does. And Carl, unfortunately, we have just about run out of time for today. So okay. I, I want to thank you, Carl, for um, reacting to Victor's experience with a remarkable insight of your own and for coming, getting in touch with me and sharing your your life with us Um that's what this show sure. is all about, and you've, you've yeah, added a lot so, to it. I was so grateful for that, for, for having heard that, that that allowed me to complete, that that allowed me to finally uh, sort that, that mystery out for myself. Hmm. Well, listen, tell, tell the audience how they might find out more about your uh, new IONS group in Prescott. Well, at the moment, I can just give my email address, and this is in, this is a work in progress at this time. But um, let me give my email address: silrack at gmail dot com, and silrack okay. is spelled S I L R A K at gmail dot com. And then Very good. once once that's gotten a little further, I can put them in contact with the um, the main person or. Uh, doing that but in the meantime i can answer questions that guy's trying to put together he's got a lot on his plate so, terrific um, well listen uh audience if you'd like to listen to this show again or any of our past shows just go to our website at nderadio.org and hit the past shows button and for more information about ions including the upcoming annual conference near seattle washington please go to their website at iands.org and join us again next monday 11 a.m. Eastern for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.